Right equipment, wrong technique. Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, reading today from the King James text. And the word of the Lord reads, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Let's go to the Lord once again in prayer. Master, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for the great old songs of the church. They encourage our hearts. They remind us, Lord, that the troubles and cares and strifes of this life are not to be compared with the joys uh, that are held for us in eternity. For I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Master, today we need, I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. My body is frail, I'm wrecked with trouble from my many allergies and I need the anointing, the touch from heaven if I'm to deliver the word of God that you've given me for the church at this hour. Help me, Lord, to preach. I can't do it without you, never could. Have no intention of ever trying. Touch this body, touch this mind, touch my spirit. Help me to deliver a word, O oh God, that the people of God will not simply hear with their ears, but they will hear with their heart. They'll receive into their spirit that it might affect challenge and change in our lives for the better. Lord, that you might perfect us and improve us, that you might draw us closer into deeper fellowship and communion with you. We ask it all in the mighty, wonderful, saving name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Praise God and amen. Many believers think today they have it all together. And their, work, their walk with God is secure and sure. They have a certain amount of understanding that causes them to embrace the notion that all is well with their soul. Yet, the truth of the matter is this. They may have the right equipment, but they are employing the wrong techniques in using that equipment. I used as my sermon illustration today a photograph that I borrowed from online of a man on a craftsman tractor, lawn tractor, and he's got a, a, what they call a lawn sweeper on the back of the tractor. You pull it behind your tractor, and there's a brush that rotates, and it pushes grass clippings and leaves and paper and anything that might be your lawn up into a large catcher area. I own one of those. Every time I mow my lawn, I go over the lawn first. The front lawn at our new house is pretty good size. And I go over the whole front lawn, and then afterwards, I go to the garage. I put my grass catcher on there, and then I go over the lawn again. But with the grass catcher, you can move faster because the faster that the brush is rotating, the more effective it is in pushing leaves and grass clippings and paper and whatever else trash up into the basket. 
Well, I recently mowed my lawn with my lawn tractor. After mowing the entire front yard, I then did as I always do, and I went to the garage and attached my grass sweeper attachment, and I began to drive across the lawn at a pretty good clip, you know, back and forth in methodical uniform fashion. My intent, of course, was to pick up all the grass clippings that my mowing the yard had created. Well, after about 20 minutes or so, I finally realized that I didn't seem to be picking anything up. I'm looking, I said, now wait a minute, I've been over that area over there several times. Why in the world are those clippings still up on the lawn there? (laughs) I looked back at my attachment on the back of my tractor and I found that the collection basket was in the up position. That's the position you bring it to when you're trying to empty the clippings from the basket. Apparently, after using it last time, I had tied it in that position, (laughs) and I failed to notice that I had done so when I attached the attachment to the back of my tractor. So here I am driving all over the lawn, you know, just praying and talking in tongues and singing like I always do. I generally wear a mask to keep the clippings because I'm allergic to everything. So I just have a good old time. And I must have looked like some kind of an idiot going over my lawn with my tractor and the basket being tied upward where it wasn't down to collect the clippings. So I had to stop my mower and get off for a minute and untie it and put the basket down. Then I had to go back and redo all the areas that I'd spent 20 minutes riding over. I must have been quite the comical sight. Well, I'm here to tell you today, so it is with many professed Christians. They're working themselves to death, doing all they believe to be right and worthy of the Lord's attention and reward, only to one day be scheduled to find out that while they had the right equipment, they were using it all wrong. You hear what I'm telling you now? Like water... It requires bringing together two elements to create truth. Water is comprised of both hydrogen and oxygen. Truth also exists when two primary ingredients are brought together. Those ingredients are the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Of God. The, the, the word of the Lord tells us today in John 17, 17, Jesus was praying and he said these words, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. In 1 John 5 and 6, the apostle John writes concerning Jesus, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. So in John 17, 17, the Lord says... Thy word is truth. In 1 John 5 and 6, John writes, Because the Spirit is truth. Well, which is it? Well, it's simple. They're both right. Both statements are right. In order to be in possession of truth, you must bring both of these things together. Not only the book, but the author of the book. 
You see, unlike most books, the Bible is not given to us by God and left in our hands, and we are without the author to help us understand why he wrote what he wrote and what he meant when he wrote certain things. No, when it comes to the word of God, the author comes with the book. Hallelujah. The spirit of the Lord comes with the book. So the word is truth, but honey, you're not going to get it without the spirit there to guide you and to lead you and to help you understand the word. It, there are so many people always talk about how many denominations and different religious organizations there are. And they say, well, this can't be right. How can there be so many? Well, it's simple because a lot of people are using the book, but they're not employing the spirit. See, if you have half the equation, then, honey, you can go off in all kind of crazy directions. You can go off in all kind of wild and whacked out uh, uh, directions. In order to receive the whole truth and nothing but the truth, you must bring together those two ingredients, the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Jesus said the Spirit of the Lord would remind us and bring to our remembrance. Listen, he said, whatsoever things I have taught you. He said all the invisible Spirit is going to do is help you to remember everything I said. So the Spirit is not saying anything new. Did you hear what I said? The Spirit is not saying anything new. No. Why should he say anything new? It's the author helping to clarify what he's already said. Hallelujah. The Spirit's not going to tell you anything that contradicts this. No. He's going to bring to your remembrance. The Word of the Lord tells us we have no need that any man teach us but the anointing which we have received of him shall teach us all things. It's the presence of God. That's what anointing means, presence of God. It's the presence of the Holy Ghost that helps us to understand the book. But trying to understand the book without the indwelling presence of the Holy Ghost is an exercise in futility. In Ephesians 1.13 we read of the word being spoken of as the word of truth. The word of God reading in whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth. In 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. James chapter 118 Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. In John chapter 15 and verse 26, we read the spirit of truth. Listen, but when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. In John 16 and verse 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, literally meaning he will not speak for himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. In 1 John 4 and 6, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of 
error. Some people erroneously believe or claim that they get the same or at least an equal benefit from doing things their own way as they would from doing it the way the Lord would have it done. For instance, I know people, I've done it myself, I don't want to stand around at the washing machine, the old, back in the day, if you were going to add fabric softener, you had to wait until the rinse cycle, and then you had to run down to the washing machine and add the fabric softener. You remember? Some of you that are old enough to remember this, a lot of you, Amy, you're too young for this, honey. You, All the washing machines you've ever dealt with probably had the little fabric softener uh, dish where you put the fabric softener in and it automatically adds it during the rinse cycle. But back in the old days, I can't believe I'm old enough to use that phrase, but back in the old days, we would have to add fabric softener manually during the rinse cycle, I remember my mother, she'd be timing it, and she'd say, i got to run downstairs real quick and put the fabric softener in because they didn't have anything that allowed you to put it in ahead of time, and then it would automatically dispense it at the right time in the wash cycle. But I know a lot of people who decided it was too much work to run downstairs or to run across the house and add that fabric softener during the rinse cycle. So they said, I'll just add it at the beginning. I'll just add it when I add the soap. And that way, you know, it'll already be in there. And I'm sure I'll get the same benefit. I'm sure it'll work just as well. I don't have to follow the manufacturer's recommendations and instructions. How many people approach God this way? Oh, I'll get the same benefit. I'll just do it my way. I don't have to do it God's way to get the same benefit. I'll take a shortcut. I'll add the fabric softener at the start. And I'm sure it'll come out just as good. Of course, forget the fact that the soap winds up washing half the fabric softener out of the fabric and it's not there to do what it's meant to do. Forget all that. No, when we're so lazy, when we decide we don't want to put forth the effort to do it the way that the manufacturer tells us to do it. But why do they tell us to do it the way they tell us to do it? Well, because they've run all kind of tests they've done all kind of experiments and they determined that that's how it works best and they want their product to work the best because the best if it works the best then the customer's likely to come back and want to buy it over and over again if you add it at the beginning of the wash cycle and it all washes out of the fabric and the soap kind of counteracts it and everything, you may decide, I'm just wasting my money. Why am I even bothering with this fabric softener? It's really not doing a whole lot of nothing. Am I telling the truth? A lot of people give up on God because they don't follow the directions. They say they want the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Guess what, honey? He is the word of truth. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Hallelujah. He is the spirit of truth. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Oh, hallelujah. He is both the word and the spirit. If you want the truth, you got to have both. And the end product is Jesus. This book will bring you to Jesus. The Spirit will bring you to Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, my God, have mercy. So many people want to take shortcuts. They don't want to do it as God has prescribed. And they think they're going to get the same benefit and the same results. But just because it's easier for you 
to just add fabric softener at the start, it does not mean that most of that softener won't be washed out during the wash cycle and it'll never have an opportunity to perform its duty on your laundry as it could have had you added it when you were directed by the manufacturer. Many today feign an interest, feign an interest. In other words, they fake it. They act interested in being led by the Holy Ghost through the pages of God's Word. I love watching preachers on television sometimes from various denominations that deny so many biblical doctrines and so many biblical truths. And yet at the start of their sermon, they'll pray, Oh, Lord, let your Spirit guide us through your Word. You don't really want that. Because if that really happened, you'd be led somewhere you don't want to go. Folks, if you think everything comes off people's lips is sincere, there's something wrong with you. Talk is cheap. My Lord, are you hearing me today? Talk is cheap. Not everybody says, Lord, lead me, guide me, help me to understand your word. Not everybody that says that means that. The problem with dealing with God is our God today knows the heart of man. So your words do not move him, but your heart does. And while many feign an interest in being led by the Holy Ghost through the Word of God, they'll say in prayer that they desire the Spirit of God to reveal truth to them. But God knows their hearts. Anything that contradicts what they've learned or what they have received by tradition or what's been handed down through their families will be flatly rejected and explained away. Many today rely upon the education that they have received, whether it be seminary, Bible school, or Christian university. So in the end, the Lord is unable to genuinely lead them as he knows they will not follow wherever he may guide them. One may play the game, but the Lord only responds to prayers which are prayed with the utmost sincerity and earnest desire for truth and revelation. I've told this story before. I grew up in a family. We had some oneness apostolic family members, not many, but a couple. We had a friend of our family who was a apostolic Jesus named preacher, Brother Tatlock. I was raised in the Assemblies of God Church, and yet even as a child, my grandmother explained to me that Brother Tatlock was a friend of the family. He had once been in the Assemblies of God, but he received the revelation of one God in Christ, and Jesus is his name. He received the revelation of Jesus' name, baptism, and the oneness of God, and he went off and started a church. The Lord called him to start a church in Wolcott, Connecticut. And my grandmother said, even though Brother Tatlock approaches uh, his theology different than we do, he's a friend of our family and we love him. We know he's a man of God. We know he loves the Lord. She said, and we've been friends with him for many, many, many decades. So I grew up exposed to the one God, uh, I'll say controversy, let's put it that way. I knew it existed. I didn't really understand oneness theology real well. I thought I did, but I didn't. Didn't understand it real well, but 
I was aware of it, okay? Let's put it that way. Many years later, I was dedicated to the Lord in Brother Tatlock's church. My mother dedicated me to the Lord in Brother Tatlock's church. Many years later, I moved to a little town in East Texas, and I was driving down the street, and I drove past a oneness apostolic Pentecostal church, and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me like He's ever spoken to me in my life, and He said, that's where I want you to go to church. I'll never forget it. I had preached a revival in this town. I preached in this little Trinitarian, independent, Pentecostal church, and the revival that I preached there spread out for months. I wanted to preach in there for months on end. We had a marvelous time. That little church got packed out, and, you know, everything was wonderful. But that's not where I was supposed to go to church at. The Lord said, no, I want you to go to that church right there. I said, Lord, that, that's not even a church that believes things the way I believe things said, that's where I want you to go. I said, okay. So I walked in the church. I walked in the door of the church, and I was committed. Before I'd ever even visited one service, I was committed committed to being there. I'm going to tell you, I wish more people would learn how to hear from God when it comes to where to go to church. Because if people would listen to God, I bet you a million dollars this building would be full up today. Be willing to bet a million dollars. But no, people don't want to hear anything that contradicts or challenges what they've already chosen to believe, what their family has passed down to them, what tradition has handed them, what their Bible college or their seminary has taught them, because they're more interested in holding to that than they are pursuing the truth. They got the right equipment, but their technique's all wrong. They're not using it right. You've got the Word of God at your disposal. You've got the Spirit of God at your disposal. But there's one ingredient missing that is necessary. Listen to me. I'm going to offend some people. Good. You deserve to be offended. You're insincere. You say you want the truth, but the truth scares you to death. I went into that little apostolic church, and I went in, listen to me, I went in committed to continuing to believe what I'd always believed. I was absolutely certain that I would have no problem clinging to everything I'd ever believed in that church, I had no problem. And guess what? The pastor, if I can say it this way, I loved him. I had a lot of respect for him. He was a good preacher in many regards. He never, ever, 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 ever one time preached on the oneness of God. Not one time. Never heard him teach on it. Never heard him talk about it. The oneness was simply accepted in that church as a given, you know. And he never expounded on it. He never. Well, I used to try to debate with him. Sometimes I'd get to talking to him and I'd try to rope him into a trinity versus the oneness debate. What about this? What about that? And Brother Davis would look at me and say, oh, no, brother, I'm not going to debate with you. He said, you'll get it. One of these days, you'll get it. <laughs> and he never taught on it. He never preached on it. He never talked about it. He said, one of these days, you'll get it. One service. Uh-oh, our electric's starting to blink a little bit. One service. I went home from church. And I don't know why, I don't know why, all of a sudden I had a strong desire 
to answer this question once and for all. I went home from church then. Now, I don't know what it was that wound up making me come to this place. But I sat down at the dining room table. And I remember I sat there and I prayed. I said, Lord, I'm tired of this. I want to know the answer and I want to know it now. Are you a trinity? Are you three people? Or are you one? And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, Put your Bible. God used to do this with me a lot years ago. He said, Put your Bible on its spine on the table. I did. And he said, Now let it go. And I just let it go and my Bible fell open. And I looked down, and the first passage that I laid my eye on was in the book of Isaiah, where he said, I am the Lord, that is my name, and beside me there is no God. And then the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, Now flip the pages. And I flipped some pages. I didn't count them. I just took, you know, the book and flipped some pages. And I looked down and the next verse I saw, I am the Lord, that is my name, and beside me there is no Savior. Do it again, I did it again. I am the Lord, that is my name, and beside me there is no other. I am the Lord, that is my name, and beside me there is no God. And then as I kept ch changing the pages, I kept every single time I was getting passages like this. All of a sudden I found myself in the New Testament. And I'm looking down and I literally look down and the first verse I look at, Have I been with you this long, Philip, and yet you don't know me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, God answered my question. And he answered it beyond the question, beyond the reasonable doubt. To this day, I've preached the one God, Jesus' name message. And I have no intention of going back. It would be a whole lot easier for me to do the work I'm doing if I could compromise this message. But I can't. I won't. I'd rather stand before God, the pastor of an empty church, having been faithful to the message, the truth he revealed to me, than stand before God with a full, packed out mega church, having compromised the word of truth that I was led to by the spirit of truth. Hallelujah. I can't do it. I won't do it. Some people say, preacher, you're just preaching this today to try to tell people who don't accept your message that they're insincere. No, no, that's not why I'm, I'm preaching it because this is what God gave me to preach. I'm also here to tell you today that I've walked that walk so I'm not talking about something I haven't had to live myself been there done it so I know what I'm talking about I understand the struggle I understand when I finally made the change and came into the apostolic faith I knew that I was going to have all kind of family issues because all my family were in the assemblies of God and church of God. And I knew many of my friends would disown me and many people would want nothing to do with me. And I knew here in the church of God I had a history, I had a track record. Uh, my overseers saw me as this uh, 
preacher with an incredible ability to uh, to start churches from scratch and to be very successful. And all of a sudden, if I come into the apostolic church, I'm literally going back to zero. I'm having to start from scratch. I'm going to have to learn a whole lot of new things. I'm going to have to do things different. going to have to make new friends. It was a scary proposition. But, but, I wanted the truth. I wanted to make certain that when I stood up in front of an audience and preached a message that the message I was preaching was truth. And I was not willing to settle for anything less. And God saw that, and God knew that. And when I asked him that night, Lord, show it to me, reveal it to me, let me see it. Is it this or is it that? I was, I was open to either or. Believe me, I was. If he led me to passages that somehow or another suggested the Trinity, I'd have bought that, okay? Every single passage he led me to, every single one contained the word one. I am one. I'm alone. I'm alone. I'm alone. I'm alone. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm here to tell you, many will feign a desire to be led by the Spirit of God. But they're insincere. God only responds to prayers which are prayed with the utmost sincerity. With the desire to understand and to know the truth and to receive revelation. In First Chronicles 28 and 9, the word of the Lord reads, And thou, Solomon, my son... Know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts, and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. You can't pull the wool over God's eyes. You can't pray prayers and cry tears and be insincere and not really want the truth and really not want revelation and expect that God is somehow fooled by your act. Doesn't work that way, folks. He told Solomon. He said, serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off Forever, Not everyone who cries, Lord, Lord, is going to enter in. If you forsake them, you'll be cast off forever. Doesn't matter if you've said, oh, Lord, I want to know the truth. But you really don't want to know the truth. You want to have what you've already chosen to believe endorsed and supported. There's a lot of people, folks, in the church world today... That's exactly where they're at. First Samuel sixteen seven. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Samuel stood in the house of Jesse and was looking at the sons of Jesse, waiting for the Lord to confirm which of those sons was to be the next king over Israel in the place of Saul. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, 
but the Lord looketh on the heart. Too many people in churches say they got the right equipment, but the wrong technique. All the spirits there, all the words there, but the sincerity is not. They're committed to their education. They're committed to their families. They're committed to their traditions. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But you've got to be committed to the truth. In Jeremiah 29, 13, the word of the Lord reads, And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. So the Lord makes it clear. You're not going to find him when you're putting in half an effort. You've got to be seeking him sincerely. You've got to be seeking him wholly. In Luke 11, 9 and 10, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be open. The Lord has promised that if we desire revelation and understanding, he is only too happy to give it to us. But one never asks a question when they assume they already know the answer. When we sincerely wish to know the truth, we will ask for answers, even if they contradict what we have always held to be true. Not tradition, loyalty to family, denominations, or education can obstruct our willingness to receive replies which do not line up with our preconceived answers. If we approach the Lord sincerely, not letting tradition, not letting education, not letting loyalty to family, loyalty to denomination or religious organization, not letting those things stand in our way. If we will seek the truth of God sincerely, he has promised I'll deliver it. Hallelujah. I will give it to you. In Matthew 10 verses 34 through 38, Jesus is speaking and he said, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. You see, our loyalty can't be to family. Our loyalty can't be to tradition. Our loyalty can't be to denomination. Our loyalty can't be to our education. He said, you got to love me. Who, what, who's Jesus? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Hallelujah. Honey, I'm sorry. I love the truth too much to be loyal to what my family believes. I love the truth too much to be loyal to what my grandparents believed or what my great parents. I don't care what they believed. I know that I have a desire for the truth of God. Hallelujah. Tell you, I could, my life could be so much easier. My ministry could be so much more successful if I could only compromise, but I can't. I'm too stubborn. Romans 14, 11, and 12, for it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, 
every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. It's rather foolish to be loyal to the beliefs of your family. It's foolish to be loyal to the beliefs of your denomination. It's foolish to be loyal to the beliefs of the educational institution that you attended because, honey, they're not going to answer for what you believe. You are. God's not going to hold them responsible for the fact that you chose to believe what you chose to believe. Say, well, but I didn't choose to believe it. I was taught it. Honey, if you're under the sound of my voice right now, then that means that God is affording you the opportunity to seek him sincerely and receive a knowledge of the truth. If you weren't hearing this message, then maybe that opportunity wouldn't be available to you. But you are, and it is. You're going to give account of yourself. You'll answer for no one else, and no one else will answer for you. Every person who... I love people who attend Bible colleges and universities and seminaries. I love people who feel so confident in their theological educations. They always make me laugh. Who picked your university? Who picked your Bible college? Who picked your seminary? You did. Why did you pick it? Well, because it's run by the denomination that I'm a part of. Yeah. Because the guy who attends First Church of God doesn't wind up going to Brigham Young, does he? The guy from the Mormon church down the street doesn't go to an Assemblies of God Bible college, does he? The fellow who grew up at First Baptist isn't likely to go to Oral Roberts University. No. You pick a university based on what they teach. Hello now. Oh, you want to get somewhere where they're going to teach you exactly what you think you already know. But they're going to help you to understand what you think you already know better. There's absolutely no, absolutely no desire for truth in there anywhere. Truth is not. A high priority, no, you're committed to your tradition. You're committed to your denomination. You're committed to what you already know. I'll never forget when I was a kid and the Lord told me, he said, you will never attend a Bible college. I said, Lord, I want to go to Bible college. I want to go to seminary. I want to." I was about 12, maybe 14 years of age. When the Spirit of the Lord, one day I was in, I remember it as vividly as if it were yesterday. I was in the downstairs bedroom at my parents' house in Connecticut, and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, Do you know what you're going to preach? Never forget it. And I said, Well, yes, Lord, of course I know what I'm going to preach. I was born and raised in the assemblies of God. I know exactly what I'm going to preach. I was just a teenager. And the Holy Ghost spoke back to me and said, No, you don't. At the time, Tommy, I had no clue what God was saying to me. I had no clue what he was saying. I remember that rattled my cage. And I thought, what does God mean by that? I don't understand what he means by that. No, I don't know what I'm going to preach. But he knew that one day I was going to get hungry enough for the truth. And I was going to ask the question in sincerity. And he was going to show me the answer. And my message was going to become drastically different than the message that I thought I'd be preaching. 
See, I always pictured myself as a kid, a married man with children pastoring First Assembly of God up here in this town or in that town. I had it all planted out. I had my future all designed in my mind. But it's amazing the paths that God will lead us down. James chapter 4, 17 issues this important warning. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. When you know the right way to go, when you know the right direction and you choose not to go that way, when you purposely choose to do different than that which you know to be right, it is sin. Oh my goodness. That's why I can't water my message down. That's why I can't compromise. No, because the minute I did, I'd miss heaven. You don't play with God. You don't play games with God. Lastly today, Proverbs 23 and 23. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Buy the truth and sell it not. Hallelujah. In other words, once you get hold of it, keep it. Don't let it go. Don't let loose of it for anything. Not every one that saith unto me, the Lord said in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What is the will of God? The will of God is that we walk in truth. That's the will of God. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. You see, the problem is, my friend, the name is powerful and the name works. Hallelujah. Just because you're able to accomplish things through the name of Jesus Christ does not by any means imply that you are in relationship with him. No, that's a powerful name. Demons tremble at that name. Hallelujah. Oh, a lot of people who others might view as being deeply spiritual, others might view them as having a deep walk with God. And yet in reality, the Lord said, they're not going to make it in the end because they're not walking in God's perfect will for their life. He wants them to walk in truth. But to walk in truth, you've got to walk in sincerity. You've got to be willing to be at odds with your family. You've got to be willing to be at odds with denominations. You've got to be willing to be at odds with religious organizations and the institutions that educated you. It's a high price to pay, but the Lord said that we must take up our cross, our cross. He said, I'll declare unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Oh, children, I want to tell you today, don't run around as a believer mowing your lawn and, and then thinking you're picking up your grass when in reality you got the right equipment, but you're using the wrong techniques. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon?